Uh, I feel like absolute shit. Can I tell my nose is peeling on my towel? Can they tell that, I'm, that I've been downing both of these for days now? I might have shot my liver. But let's not talk about that. I'm here to talk about another movie. Our 31 Days of Popcorn Ween. And today, I finally get a chance to revisit a movie that I was kind of cold on the first time. But now, a couple years later, looking back, I'm starting to have different thoughts. So, I hope you enjoy this review. Click that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and buckle up, because it's time to roll the credits. Fear is a tool. But when that light hits the sky, it's a warning. If this continues, it won't be long before you've nothing left. I don't care what happens to me. I'm vengeance. Now this is going to be a retrospective more rather than a review. I will go over the film for anybody who hasn't seen it and just wants to hear my thoughts on it. But mainly in this video, I want to take a moment to consider some of the criticisms I levied against this movie two years ago when it came out. A lot of people were very upset with the Batman because of some very minor things. And admittedly, in some aspects, those minor things got to me as well. The main thing that I didn't like was the whole Riddler has an online community of uh, incels that are his henchmen. And that's a lot of what the, the you know online media coverage was about during that movie. But here's the thing. That was shortly before I realized all those people making all those videos about how everything's woke. I didn't realize that they were all bullshit too. And that, you know, shouldn't be listening to them at all. You get inundated with so much media trying to tell you what something is that sometimes you don't really get a chance to actually assess it honestly for yourself. And I feel like that's what I've done now with the Batman. I've, I've had enough time to pass and have had separation from those disgusting nerd communities that think that everything's woke and blah. that's no one cares no one cares what is between the main character's legs or what the color of their skin is or their background we just want characters we can root for okay your your woke bullshit it doesn't apply it's irrelevant so having now had time to rethink my position and Rewatched the Batman a couple times and try to put those kind of thoughts out of my head and just trying to enjoy it as a movie. I gotta say, I think the Batman might be one of the best Batman movies. I know, right? Surprise, surprise me too. Going back, I'm like watching it. I go back, I'm just sitting there going, All right, I'm gonna play this, I'm gonna watch it, try to keep an open mind. And within 30 seconds, I'm pulled into the movie, and every, every little once in a while. The thought would pop back in my head, oh god, I'm gonna get to this ending and I'm gonna just start rolling my eyes again. But as I watched it again and again, the ending stopped annoying me so much. I started picking up on little details here and there that actually added to that. Now, there are a couple lines that Catwoman says um, in the movie that are still a little bit eye rolling. But here's the thing. Catwoman is a poor bartender at a criminal nightclub where she sees nothing but 
rich, wealthy men come in and abuse drugs, women, and alcohol nonstop. Of course, she might be a little on the socially liberal side. Say things like white privilege. Wait. The only thing that could have completely just negated that line for me is if they would have cut to Batman and he would have rolled his eyes a little bit. Because <laughs> he's a rich white guy. He should be like, yeah, we all got it so great. <laughs> we're all just really, we're all just living up the life. All anyone cares about in this place are these white privileged assholes. The mayor, the commissioner, the DA, now Thomas and Bruce Wayne. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that psycho's right to go after these creeps. But stuff like that, a lot of times can kind of ruin a movie for a modern audience when you try to put too much modern sensibilities into it. But, the Batman, I think, now, with time and distance, actually did a pretty decent job of adding that as another layer to some of the characters. It's not saying that it's the worldview that all white people are bad, or all rich people are bad, or everyone in Gotham is bad. It's not. It's this one person's very small point of view who's had a very fucked up life. And when you take that into consideration, it actually kind of makes a little bit more sense. You're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. At least you're not throwing paint on the Mona Lisa. You're just scratching up gang members <laughs> with, your, with your cat claws. <laughs> My point is, when this movie first came out, people reacted very emotionally to this film. And I did too. I reacted very emotionally. It was a very tense time for the world and for movies in general. I wasn't a huge fan of the, the Planet of the Apes trilogy that Matt Reeves did, but I knew he was a competent filmmaker. And it wasn't really until watching this movie several more times, digging into interviews with Matt Reeves, watching behind the scenes footage, to actually fully understand how much in love with Batman these people are. The Batman follows our hero as he dives into an investigation on the sadistic killings of key political figures in Gotham, starting with the mayor, the commissioner, and then the DA. As he investigates this series of crimes, he begins finding connections to his own family that makes him question everything about Gotham and about his own family history within the city. The serial killer being, of course, a new spin on the Riddler. Very much inspired by the Zodiac Killer. Even his Riddler symbol is very reminiscent of the Zodiac's real uh, Zodiac symbol that was stolen from a watch, apparently. Watch talk. Now, this story takes place in Batman's second year. I know, very different from Batman Begins, where it was year one. Nope, this is year two. And while that kind of did annoy me at first, honestly, don't care anymore. The movie's good enough to where it doesn't matter to me. A young Batman can be very interesting if approached correctly. And I think Matt Reeves and Robert Pattinson did a very great job of trying to find the core of this character. A man who was so torn apart by trauma and grief that he has completely drifted away and been absorbed by darkness but he has turned that darkness outward and figured out a constructive way to apply it and for about 90% of the movie Batman and Bruce Wayne spend their entire screen time working on this investigation you get a lot of really cool set pieces in this movie um, the, the reveal of Batman at the beginning is one of the best reveals of Batman I've ever seen on film. The uh, the gangs surrounding the Asian man at the train station about to rob and or murder him. And then you just hear clinking of boots. It reminded me very much of the, uh, the scene from Inglorious Bastards that was kind of ripped off from the Warriors where Eli Roth is banging a baseball bat on the wall in a tunnel as he's coming out to murder a Nazi with it. 
the the boots give you a bit of sense of Batman's kind of a cowboy. He's got the the jingle of like almost spurs on a cowboy boot, but it's ominous. It's dark, and you see this figure emerge from the darkness. That it's a very different looking Batman than what we're used to. This Batman, they wanted to make sure that his suit was very flexible, but looked like it could take a shotgun blast in your point blank range. And everything down to the details of just the stitching of that suit were considered for tactical advantage and even uh, theatrics a bit. The first time I put on this bat suit, there's so much more maneuverability. You could actually jump around, you could crash into stuff. The suit does not make him invincible. It's just a few panels of bulletproof armor. And the rest of it is how much Bruce believes in it and how much his adversaries are scared of it. They wanted Batman to really absorb into the shadows in this movie. And they do a pretty damn good job of accomplishing that. They even have a, a nice scene in the beginning where you see a guy in a weird onion smiley mask rob a convenience store. And he's he's escaping and he turns down this alley and the alley's just dark. And he stops. And he's like looking around. And he decides, you know what? I don't want to go down this dark alley because... Batman might be down there. And then he gets hit by a car. <laughs> like a dumbass. So many great details. You've got um, this renewal fund that was set up for, for Gotham 20 years ago by Bruce's parents that seems kind of unimportant, but just seems like a detail until later in the mystery when you find out that's actually a very big part of the mystery. But they tell you this. They tell you that there's a renewal fund to help restore Gotham back to its former glory. And then they show you a bunch of dilapidated buildings. Half-built skyscrapers. Homeless people in the streets. Real grimy stuff that a city can... Only a city can provide. And even the place where the bat signal is... Is a dilapidated skyscraper that the renewal fund never finished. And all of that is kind of a, a hint to what has happened to Gotham since Thomas and Martha Wayne died. And it's kind of a reflection of what happened to Batman internally since his parents died. He is as much of a desolate landscape of a person as the city is. He's collected all the trash of the world in his heart, and now he carries it around with him. It's decaying like this city, but he's compelled to fight it because what he's really fighting is that within himself. One of the things that Robert Pattinson was able to very well convey with his performance was that every fight in this feels personal to an extent. Robert Pattinson said he wanted to make sure that every time he threw a punch at someone, he wanted you to be able to see that Batman was visualizing the guy who shot his parents and seeking, as he put it, vengeance. I'm vengeance. But that's not the point of this movie. Vengeance is not the point of the movie. The point of the movie is actually hope. And that's why the last act is actually important. Unlike the Dark Knight where they wanted to prove that Joker was an agent of chaos. And then he does something that's antithetical to being an agent of chaos. If he, if you were really agent of chaos, you would have fucked Harvey Dent's mind up and then skipped away on that bus full of children going, Oh, my job is done. Oh, happy day. I'm going to ride off for the sunset as Joker and win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck the third act. Like that. That's that's accomplishing the character in, in The Dark Knight. They established that Joker is a complete and utter wild card. 
and then completely cut its legs out in the last act when he's trying to prove a point. Chucky don't care about proving points. He cares about fucking with your head and laughing at you. In this film, though, Batman starts off the movie looking to be a fist in the dark for all the injustices that he felt that anybody in Gotham's ever served, particularly him. And he takes that to the, the biggest extreme. He's constantly sending people to the hospital, breaking bones, smacking the shit out of the penguins, uh, door guys, the twins. <laughs> Those guys are hilarious, by the way. They always get the shit kicked out of them. Every scene they're in, shit gets kicked. They get punked or shit kicked out of them one way or the other. The Batman's more about how a man's quest for vengeance can lead you down a very, very dark path and inspire even further darkness in other people. Because the Riddler in this movie is entirely inspired by the Batman's actions. He thinks, great, there's this guy here who is looking to serve justice to these corrupt, disgusting people. But the difference is, Batman wants actual justice. He wants these people to be put in their place. He wants these people to stop doing these horrific and destructive activities at the expense of everyone else just to bolster their own bank accounts. Very relatable things. Like, I mean... Hell, like, how many people were part of the whole Occupy Wall Street thing 20 years ago or however long it was? Like, people often feel like those in charge have a out of balance of power and money. And the reason why people like Batman so much is because he's someone that comes from that world who decides they're right. They do have too much power. These, these crazy people, these ruthless people, these psychotic people stomp on the little guy just to make money and collect influence. So Batman, as a member of their world, dresses up as a a Dracula, essentially, or a Zorro, which plays, in which case, uh, John Turturro actually refers to Batman as Zorro in one of the scenes. That's a nice little touch, Matt Reeves. Batman was inspired partially by Zorro and the Shadow and all those old serials like that. But where the Riddler's main goal is destruction and vengeance for all the wrongs that he thought he was done his entire life by the elites of Gotham, Bruce is actually trying to make a difference. He doesn't want just vengeance. He also wants to help people. He wants to fix things. And in this movie, those two sides of him are battling constantly. And Riddler is there as a, almost like a foil for us to really see the internal struggle Batman's having with these different sides of himself. And in the last act, when he has to take out the Riddler gang who are bearing down on the the mayoral candidates campaign rally and amongst a huge flood of the city, he realizes after beating the other shit out of one of Riddler's henchman what he's done he didn't inspire the way he, he hoped he would he hoped that he would show people that like crime doesn't pay that living this way is destructive to everyone and if you live this way someone's gonna come to your life and destroy you over it and he, he realizes that he actually needs to be more he allows the cops to finish up rounding up all the uh the leftover Riddler henchmen, and he instead decides to risk his life to stop all the people down in the water below from being electrocuted, and to lead them to safety, and even help the, the military life flight some of these people out. He goes from the beginning just wanting to beat people up, to at the end he realizes that he needs to be a beacon of hope for these people. These people in Gotham who who have no one to back them up. Riddler, on the other hand, wants to just destroy everything. And that really puts Batman's own motivations in perspective for himself. And I think that's what Nolan was trying to accomplish with the whole last act with Joker, but it just didn't work. The whole boat thing just 
does not work on any level. It's dumb. We get it. You did a thought experiment, but it's real. Grow up, Nolan. Learn how to be around people. This movie really, the Batman really sets itself apart. By not just treating the Batman as a guy who goes around punching people and fighting Two-Face or the Joker or whatever. His moniker is the world's greatest detective. And this, in my opinion, is the first live-action movie to actually give us the world's greatest detective. And no, he doesn't have those weird fancy gadgets that no, uh, no one's Batman had. The little hand drill to cut out a brick and reconstruct a bullet in a computer. That was so stupid. But no, he uses actual old school, well, little twists on old school detective methods. Collects evidence. Looks for clues. Many of which are... are kind of helped to him by Riddler through these these letters, these little uh, these little cards that Riddler leaves for him at all the crime scenes. But it's still, like, you still get the the sense of detective work that you get from classic movies like The Maltese Falcon or Chinatown or uh, Seven or Zodiac. You have all the pieces, but you don't have the answer until the final culmination of that information in the in the leader's or the in the hero's mind that gives you clarity of the situation and like in a lot of those cases batman's almost too late the sea walls get blown due to riddler's bombs that he set around the city and it almost seems like it's hopeless that's why it's so important that Batman has us turn at the end. Because they, they set up all this... This mental framework for Batman. What he is, what he wants. And Riddler is there to shake him to the core. And make him really realize why he's out there every night fighting. And it's not because he wants to get vengeance for his parents. That may have been the way it started, but that's not why he's here. He is here for a different reason. He is here to be Gotham's dark protector. And you really get the sense that, that that's what he wants by the end. He has a little conversation with Catwoman at a graveyard where she talks about going to Bloodhaven. He's like, hey, would you come with me? We could go be the bat and the cat and, you know, do all kinds of crazy stuff. Maybe we'll have sex in our costumes. Who knows? And he says, no, he says, I can't, I have work here to do. There's a lot of things that I have to do. And this is only the beginning. I thought it might be the end of the Batman because of the Riddler, but no, in fact, it's actually the beginning. This case that was very deeply connected to his family has revealed to him his true purpose in Gotham. What other Batman movies done that? Batman 1989, you know, that's that's always been my gold standard for Batman movies. Editing's a little wonky uh, by modern standards. Great movie, great performances all around. Not a detective movie. Joker shows up, starts causing chaos. Batman is just reacting the whole movie. Uh, Batman Returns. Penguin shows up. It's kind of a mystery where he came from, but we know, so it's not really... It's more of like Batman being reacting again, trying to stop a bad guy. Same thing with Batman Forever, Batman and Robin. It's all like those movies are all just Batman reacting to bad guys showing up and doing wild shit. Now with uh, the Nolan movies, he tried a little harder to work in the detective stuff, and we even get some you know nice groundwork of his little gadgets and things that he uses to monitor people and you know, figure out things and spy on people and keep his eyes on, on Gotham's corrupt, uh, you know, echelon. But still, none of those movies ever really got deep into detective work. Like, the, the deepest ever got was The Dark Knight when he's, again, reacting to everything that Joker is doing, but he's trying to figure out Joker's plot. That's kind of a detective story, but not really. 
It's more of a thriller kind of plot. The Batman is the first time that I think anybody ever got the atmosphere of those detective comments down correctly. The atmosphere and the plot, the pacing, the doling out of little bits of information that paint a wider picture. A proper mystery. Batman might as well be Kenneth Branagh on uh, the Orient Express with a big mustache for most of this movie because a lot of it he's not spending fighting or chasing people or anything like that. He's just looking for clues and trying to figure out the pieces of information. And one of the best scenes involves Colin Farrell, Penguin, where they're, they think he's the rat that helped take down the Maronis. And they're questioning him and, and they said, are you not El Rata Alada? Which means the rat with wings. And it's Penguin who tells him that's the worst Spanish you ever heard. He's like, El Rata? It's La Rata. And then Batman has a, you know, an epiphany. Boom, light bulb goes on. He goes, oh, you are El Rata Alada. Oh... It's a website. I'm thick. <laughs> I'm dumb. <laughs> That's the way I felt when I when the guys were like, "Oh, you are L. I get it. I see what you did there, Matt." There's a lot of layered storytelling that goes on in this movie. A lot of Easter eggs. If you are a Batman comic book fan, you will see a lot of those comic books in this movie. Mainly what he pulled on was Frank Miller's Year One and The Long Halloween, which is the same books that Nolan pulled on, but you could really see the difference in their interpretations. Nolan mainly used it to give us Two-Face that he wasted in like 30 minutes. But Matt Reeves uses it to help build a world, to help us understand a city that is so corrupt and cannibalistic in many ways that it would create a man like Batman. He even he even pulled on such works as Hush and uh, really wove these story elements into this kind of new story in a way that is, is a little fresh. You know, um, in Long Halloween, the main story is about the holiday killer who is going around killing uh, different key members of Gotham, uh, Gotham's elite, and their underworld on holidays. And he thinks it's one person, turns out to be Alberto Falcone. But if you watch the Penguin, you will know that there's not going to be a holiday killer because Alberto gets gunned down by the Penguin in like the first 15 minutes of the episode. So, no holiday killer. But, those same kind of beats, he reused for the Riddler. He gave those kind of, uh, those, those little serial killer kind of quirks and stuff to the Riddler. Slapped on a Zodiac 7 kind of paint job so that people had a immediate understanding of what kind of film we were going to do. I know a lot of people want to talk shit about homages and cinematic lineage. I'm talking to you, kid of the North. But here's why that exists. Cinematic lineage is there because movies establish, older movies establish in people's minds a framework for an idea. Westerns have their own cinematic language. Uh, mysteries, detective movies have their own, or noir films, if we're going to be a cinematic person about it. Noir films have their own cinematic language. Comic book movies even have their own cinematic language, which is mostly bland and just a vomit of colors. So, choosing a film noir aesthetic to paint over something that's usually, you know, looks like a child threw up Skittles, it gives it a, a much more realistic depth. The world feels lived in. It feels real. Even though it's not connected to our reality, 
it still feels like real people live in this Gotham. You have a sense of the slums, of the nice areas, of the inner city, the homeless, the, the type of people that live in these cities, the type of people that work in these cities, the food trucks, the, the traffic, the architecture. All of it is very detailed and handpicked by Matt Reeves and his team to create this otherworldly city that feels tangible, that feels like you can touch it. And all that philosophy trickles down to every aspect of this film. Down to how the characters interact, how the city has evolved over time, who the people in the city are, um, the disadvantages of certain demographics in the city, the advantages of other demographics in the city, um, the types of corruption that can become prevalent in governmental institutions. All of that feels hyper real. It, it feels like it should be a movie about a, a political scandal or something in the way that they, they handle these characters. But then you have this otherworldly character of Batman come in, who is the world's greatest detective, who is not trusted by the police except for Jim Gordon. And you have this very fantastical kind of person dealing with these very real things in this hyper gritty setting. And it just gives every character that much more depth. Nolan tried to accomplish it, but it, honestly, his Gotham didn't really have a lot of character to it. It just kind of looked like Chicago or Detroit or Vancouver or wherever. It just looked like another city. Gotham in the Batman is wholly unique. It even has little callbacks to the Tim Burton Batman. The Tim Burton Batman was designed by a man who eventually, let's just say, committed seppuku. <laughs> let's just put it that way. But that man was a very tortured human being, and he created a very tortured, gothic looking Gotham. Something that lived up to Gotham's name. And Matt Reeves is the first one since then to actually accomplish that again with this wonderful set design and production design. And the the places that they chose for their exteriors all over the world really add to the realistic feeling of this city, which in turns gives you more to grasp onto with the characters, gives the stakes more tangible feelings, really puts you in this world. Now, the performances in this version of the Batman are top-notch. Robert Pattinson brings in a great tortured performance as a young, still trying to figure things out, Bruce Wayne. Zoe Kravitz does a really good job of bringing Catwoman to life, making her full of personality, angst, and anger. Very feminine, fatale kind of sensibilities. John Turturro is an immaculate Carmine Falcone. And his replacement in The Penguin actually is pretty good too, uh, Mark Strong. Both are great performances for Carmine Falcone. Colin Farrell just chews up every bit of uh, set he can with his performance as the, as the Penguin, and it's absolutely amazing. Colin, I mean, I know people are talking about The Penguin right now. It's a great show. And in many cases, I think The Penguin helped me kind of appreciate this movie a little more. And it's very measured, like these, the movie and the Penguin are both very measured, kind of precise storytelling. They're not just throwing things against the wall and seeing what would stick, you know, like, uh, say, uh, ice skates in a bat suit. <laughs> They're not doing any of that. Everything in the Matt Reeves Batman universe, the crime saga universe, whatever he calls it, is very precise and deliberate. Everything you see on screen is immaculately curated. The actors were chosen for specific things. No one has ever seen Colin Farrell like this before. And now with the Penguin Show, we are seeing it on a magnitude that is unheard of, really digging into that character. And in a lot of cases where 
subsequent TV shows that dig into the backstory of certain characters take away from the film, the Penguin is acting as very poignant supplemental material for this universe. And it really just shows how much Matt Reeves and the other writers have been working on Penguin and the production designer and the actors and the costume designers and the effects works and the storyboard artists and all that. How much they really just care about every little thing that goes on the screen. There is almost no inch of real estate at any moment in this movie that does not hold some bit of information. There's even a point where a newscast references uh, Thomas Elliot, also, also known as Hush, one of Batman's big villains from the 2000s, mentions his father. They show a picture of Hush's father on TV. It's part of the renewal fund. Will we see Hush in the future? I kind of hope so. It'd be nice if that's the second Batman. Do a little, uh, keep, keep the stories very personal. Because that's one of the things about the Batman that also separates it from the other Batman movies. The plot is very intrinsically linked to Batman and his family history and his, I hate the word trauma, but that's essentially what it is. The, the damn, the scars in his heart from what happened to him as a child. It, this movie is very, very personal. And when you get to the end, for me at least, I felt like I knew exactly where Batman was like mentally in all of this and I knew exactly where the city was in all of this and now with the Penguin show we knew exactly where the, the Undercity is with all of this so much happens in this movie and it's so precise and intricately woven every story plot thread is used to its highest ability and highest function the look of this movie is one, it, 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 by and far the best, not one of the the best looking Batman movie ever made they even used volumes to help do set extensions lots of different techniques to make this world feel real and I think they did a very good job I, I think I was too harsh on it in 2022 I think I still was hanging on to that idea of I want my Nolan Batman back, but kind of years later looking back on the Nolan Batmans, not quite, uh, not quite the Batman movies that I had really wanted, even though there were a lot of very strong performances in those. I think this this Batman movie has been the most true to the comics and to the world while giving us something fresh to chew on. There are lots of hints of, like, Godfather and Goodfellows, Seven, Sopranos, uh, The Wire. Like, there's there's all these influences that people have in the back of their mind that Matt Reeves has used as building blocks to tell you endless information about these characters without ever having to utter a word. Just seeing Batman alone in his Batcave... And looking at the construction of the Batcave, looking at the construction of the Batmobile, his bat suit, all of that, the fact that it's an old Wayne terminal below the, the skyscraper where he, he now lives, all of that is detail that adds to these characters. Because that's what's important in all in all these things. The story, while being important, is always going to be secondary to the characters. Because if you don't have characters that people can relate to, can dig into, can like, can root for, they're not going to care about what they're doing. You care about Batman and about his quest for justice and vengeance. And you you feel almost kind of proud at him in the movie where he's faced with this, this choice of do I want to be a symbol for hope? Or do I want to punish exclusively? And that's what Riddler wants to do. He just wants to punish these people. But Batman chooses to take the correct path and figure out a way to be something more, something better, something that 
can really turn the luck of that city around. And at the beginning of the film, he's questioning if he's had any impact at all. By the end, the end of the film, he knows he's had an impact, but it wasn't the one he wanted. And he makes that choice to make people's lives better. And that's that's the importance of this movie. It doesn't matter where you come from, what awful things have happened to you in your life, what awful things you've done in your life. It matters about the choices you make moving forward. How do you make things right? And I think that's why this, this movie is ultimately great. Like, I I never would have thought that the Twilight guy would have end up being in the best Batman movie, but I think this might be the best Batman movie. Unless you count 1968, you can't beat that shark repellent, bro. <laughs> Hand me down the shark repellent bat spray. Robin, quick, shark repellent. You got it. Pop, bang, zip. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think this, after a couple of years of consideration and thinking harder on the, the Nolan films and looking back on the Tim Burton films, Tim Burton, he gave us something we'd never seen before with, with Batman. And he upped that with Batman Returns. Then Schumacher just did whatever the studio executives wanted to do so they could make toys and you know, how that went out. And then Nolan tried to take a more realistic approach Go to a younger Batman, really try to dig into who he is and what he cares about. And while a lot of that worked, some of it didn't. And I, I can't predict how the future Matt Reeves Batman movies will turn out. But if this film and The Penguin Show are any indicator, I have some high hopes for Batman Part 2. I think the Batman is going to definitely stand the test of time and I hope that people who may have not given it a chance before or people who didn't like it as much the first time give it a watch or give it a rewatch and really let the things that Matt Reeves and his uh, his writing are trying to say with this character because while Batman a lot of times can be considered a kind of a goofy character I think Batman is the pinnacle archetype of what a lot of young men especially strive to be. Someone who sacrifices themselves for the greater good of others. Someone who protects their family and their city. And someone who, uh, you know, becomes a billionaire. <laughs> like, I think a lot of it's like kind of uh, male fantasy fulfillment stuff with, with Batman. But that that's what stories are. They're supposed to be giving us templates and, ide and ideas to live our lives by or things to think about in which we can reflect in our own lives and for it being a, a silly comic book movie I think Matt Reeves has done a hell of a job of making this Batman universe feel 100% real and these characters feel authentic in that world and the story feels authentic in that world and a little bit to our time, you know? I think that this film will end up being one of the highest considered Batman movies amongst fans. I know it's definitely, like, top tier for me at this point. Um, I would have kind of put it middling before. But maybe, maybe the Penguin has helped add to that. I don't know. All I know is the Batman's a great movie and I I judged it just way too harshly. Well, I think that's going to do it for this uh, retrospective. I've already eaten up probably about 40 minutes of your time. Um, thank you so much for watching this review. I hope you enjoyed this 31 days of popcorn ween. We've been having a lot of fun making these videos. We're going to keep making more produced videos. Different subject matters, not just reviews. Um, I've got ideas for videos are in the works. Definitely going to fix the Dark Knight eventually. Eventually. Uh, may even try fixing Joker too. I don't know. Uh, we got we got a lot of good stuff coming down the pipeline. So if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button. Join us for another one tomorrow 
See, did Ken say what he was going to do? Absolutely not. And Simper's out of Freddy movies. What the hell is he going to do? Is he just going to, like, make up Freddy? He's going to get, like, an AI to make him a Freddy movie and then, like, review that? Or is he just going to pick movies that no one's ever heard of and will not click on? Probably the second one. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Hopefully you come join us for the live streams. Usually Sundays. Uh, we're kind of getting a little um, sporadic with the schedule just because of how busy we all are lately. But uh, subscribe. Hit that notification button. Come join us when we're live. Join us for the premieres of these videos. And if you haven't yet, click the, the playlist that's going to be popping up here in a second. And start from day one with Tucker and Dale vs. Evil and meet us back here. Until then, you guys have a great one.